Hello everybody, my name is Luke Marr and this is Hot La Mode and today on Hot La Mode we are coming to you with our reviews of New York Fashion Week's Fall 2021 collections. Now I'm going to be really honest, there wasn't a lot going on over at New York Fashion Week. Not much, not, just about n nothing, kinda, pretty much. Except for the designers we're going to be talking about, a lot of the big brands like Michael Kors, Tom Ford, Calvin Klein, you know, the independent, super duper cool, amazing designers that we love to to talk about like Peter Doe, Christopher John Rogers, Pierre Moss, they didn't really show either. So for the most part, these are a lot of sort of independent, cool young brands that are keeping New York Fashion Week alive. And honestly, I have the utmost respect for them. So let's get into these reviews. First up is Prabal Garung. Now, Prabal Garung this season gave me hope for New York fashion scene. American fashion is known for its commerciality and mass-produced culture, but Prabal threw that out the window this season and instead gave us a fun and uplifting collection that felt like a shakeup from the casual and comfortable pieces many of us have been so used to wearing over the last year or so. A loose red suit opened the collection. It's bright yet commercial and can Considering Prabal is an independent label, being able to bring the colorful world of Prabal Garang to customers while still making product that will sell is of the utmost importance to many brands in my opinion. A strapless 80s gown, opulent ruffles, and flounces of fabric in polka dots brings back notions of the glamour and reckless spending that the 1980s is so well known for. Leg of mutton sleeves are mixed with a bold 1980s shoulder to add to the dramatics of the shape, while a red corset covers the look and a high High slit skirt matches the salacious red. I actually think this is a brilliant look. Prabal has melded together what feels like the late Georgian period and the 1980s in a brilliant way. From the shoulders and sleeves we mentioned earlier to the fact that corsets are placed over top and ruched skirts are paired with it, it just feels like ye old Prabal Garant. Polka dots get angular updates, the 1980s upside down triangle is in full effect, while perforated dresses also bolster the angular styles Prabal is pushing. Not every polka dot or floral dress is made equal, though. A dramatized black flare suit is crisp and funky and paired with a simple pink corset top. It continues this mixing and mashing of period styles. Asymmetrical takes on the suit and cocktail dress don't feel particularly smart nor revolutionary, making them seem a little bit more mad 1980s movie costumes than viable looks for customers to actually purchase. Black pieces with floral motifs and gold polka dots don't exactly draw one in, but are are definitely commercial enough to get customers interested. The pink corset makes its return and this time paired with striking red flare pants and a lovely gathered cocktail dress in pink floral prints seems to reinvigorate the 1980s notions we saw earlier. Pink moiré silk styles are seen and the sisterhood of the traveling pink corset finds a new look in a pink oversized suit. Black and white lace handkerchief cut gowns are Divine, beautiful, stunning, lovely. The lace does not feel dated, but rather quite sharp, and the continuation of black and white feather jackets seen during the Fall 2020 collection was a nice nod back to a strong Prowl show. I'm interested in Prowl's exploration of tweed. It's nothing new, but I do want to know if customers gravitate towards the fabric, even if it's not from Chanel. A high slit black sequin dress is adorned with silver bows, while a trio of pink dresses feels shoppable, but with the gaucheness of the 1980s definitely on display. A feather bubble skirt is decadent and paired with a nicely tailored white blazer, it's almost sold me on the idea that this could show up to an event and be somewhat perceived as normal. I guess it's my normal though, but... Still, normal enough for me. Prabal's pink corset top proves that in the finale look, it can actually be quite diverse in terms of use as a two-piece ball gown set finishes the whole collection off. For customers, smart purchases are ruling their shopping decisions, and while some might find a corset a frivolous purchase, Prabal proves it's far more multifaceted than one might initially think. Overall, it's a collection that is trying to bring some life back to American fashion, and rejecting the mass consumerism we are known for. Prabal growing this season lets us dream, but also keeps a sense of subtle realism for those looking to act on this American dream, and that's smart enough to me. Next up is Tia Adeola. Tia Adeola is the young designer known for her sheer ruffled sets, seen on celebrities like Gigi Hadid and Dua Lipa, and more recently she's known for her sartorial takes on masks. For her spring 2021 collection titled Le Noir Est Beau, or Black is Beautiful, she continues her exploration of art periods this season, in particular the Renaissance. The collection started off with a pearl-covered bodysuit and long ruffle sheer duster coat. Pearls on sheer fabric have been explored before by the brand, but here this duster has a more opulent 
turbulent feeling. And while I'm not the biggest fan of the bodysuit, as it's quite simple, Areola does dress performers like Lizzo, SZA, and Caliuchis, who no doubt might clamor for performance wear like this. Areola also has an affinity for sheer pieces. It's what she has made her name off of. So a sheer white lace dress held together by buckles seems like a smart step into expanding that brand trope. I will say I'm disappointed by the half spaghetti strap, half real strap moment going on there though. It's also hard not to notice the nods to the 1970s styles, this white fringe halter top being one. Areola is young and that need to go out and turn looks isn't lost on her, even during a pandemic. I'm not saying that she's going out, but what I'm saying is she understands the girls want to go out. A strapless white sheer dress is covered with feathers on the bust and on the skirt, and it descends all the way down, but allows the waist to be quite clean. In reality, the waist is actually naturally highlighted by the lack of feathers. And at the same time, it creates this fringe-like effect all throughout the skirt, utilizing the feathers as well. I feel strange talking about more conservative cuts of clothing as a look is fully sheer, like this dress, but at the same time, this mixture of a shin-length dress that's piped in lace and has a very respectable V-neckline piped in ruffles feels free, yet mature. I also don't see that as a bad thing if there's a customer for it. And the stripes look quite intricate as well. A blue silk blazer set is interesting. Areola sheer sets are a best seller, but might not be wearable for every single market segment. So segueing into what seems like a more youthful business wear seems like a smart idea in my opinion. Many older people might not view this as professional enough, but a blazer, skirt, and a top like this might be the new three-piece suit. Now, you're probably gonna say, in what world? Well, Areola is only 24, on the earlier side of Gen Z, and if this isn't a look at what this up-and-coming generation sees as viable, viable uniform solutions, I don't know what does. And let's be frank, does a crop top really impede somebody's ability to do their job? I don't think so. A white sheer look is embroidered with what looks like meandering vines and is piped in ruffles, making the brand signature not the focal point, but a supportive technique to bolster the look. The look is sexy yet opulent, and it works. As soon as you see this jumpsuit filled with white embroidery and piped in white feathers, you are instantly reminded of Cher's 1974 Bob Mackie iconic jumpsuit. As the conversation about referencing and copying is ever ongoing, I will say Areola makes almost no attempt to hide that this is referencing this iconic Mackie look, which I almost find commendable. The look ties into her brand, Mackie no longer makes said jumpsuit, and it's definitely not as see-through as the original, which to me feels like any other designer honoring their predecessor's work. I mean, listen, where would we be without Mutual Prada referencing Yves Saint Laurent? Where would we be without, uh, a lot of people referencing each other? That's what fashion is. Get over it. Unless it's like a copy that's so blatant and ridiculous from a big company. A blue silk halter style gown is held together by crystal covered clips and is piped in ruffles and it's hot to say the very least. It might turn me a little bit. The daring deed of exposing the wearer's pelvis to some extent might be seen as vulgar to some, but I think it's rebellious, daring, and dramatic, and I find it just another take on the idea of sheerness. A sheer three-piece set made up of a jacket, skirt, and top are covered in pink and yellow artificial flowers, and I'm sure it catches some clients' eyes, but isn't exactly exciting. Although it definitely does play on this notion of embellishing sheer garments, which is part of the brand signatures. A halter dress in pink and beige has a matching veil train, but isn't too interesting, while a pink asymmetrical gown with high slit and ruffle piping close out the collection. The strips of tinsel that create a cup on one side is concerning, but does technically play to the idea of sheerness somewhat. But the look overall disappoints, especially for a finale piece. Overall, Tia Adeola is navigating building a brand and a pandemic. This season, she reinforced brand tropes well and experimented, which didn't always work out, but is always commendable. Next up is Victor Glamod. Now, Victor Glamod has quickly become one of my favorite knitwear designers over the past year. I mean, he's been working to make leisure wear mainstream since 2006, I'm just very late to the party. This season, Glamod is in his prime, as style and comfort have never been more front and center. The collection started with a one-shoulder double rib cutout dress. Asymmetry is a staple within Glamod, and this look combines that with daring cutouts and what I'm sure is a cozy knit. A black knit cape with white piping is refined and professional, while a black knee-length skirt helps to push the point that Glamod is what St. John's wishes it was. Cool and clean knitwear that you can actually wear 
everywhere. Also, why have they not hired him yet? I'm confused. A more casual high-waisted pant and a white V-striped sweater again feels casual yet respectable, while a black and white short set shows Glamod's take on deconstruction. An orange flare set has a 1970s feel, and considering that the 1970s was all about the prioritization of comfort over glamour, it makes sense. And yet at the same time, it's still pretty glamorous, which then sort of brings in that Studio 54 sort of glamour of the 1970s and disco, etc. Etc. An orange polo dress with scalloped hem doesn't feel as cool as the rest of the collection though. And I think most of the looks before this show that Glamod knows how to make his customer look seasoned without making them feel dated. An orange skirt set quickly reinforces the previous point. Glamod is very precise in his ability to toe the line between fashionable and professional. A patchwork knit jacquard in black and gray tones first makes itself known in t-shirt and culottes form and eventually branches out into capes and dresses as well. I personally wouldn't buy the motif, but I do think the more Glamod develops its own textiles, the stronger the brand becomes. Pinstripe styles in black and yellow also arrive, from more performance wear pieces to strapless jumpsuits. It's not exactly what I would consider glamorous, but would it sell at Target? Probably. And I honestly don't even mean that as an insult. The design just feels very accessible. Back cutout pinstripe dresses in black and yellow are dreamy and simple, while a one shoulder shirt and pants set is making me feel much more at ease with asymmetry. The collection finished out with monochromatic knitwear that looked easy and clean and classic. This season, Glouad showed its range. Some of the range was a bit rough, but for the most part, it was a lush and neat selection of pieces that are easily worn and desired by the everyday person. If that's not what a small business should be doing right now, I don't know what they should be doing. Finally, let's talk about Gabriella Hurst. Now, Gabriella Hurst is one of fashion's hottest names. The designer is soon going to show her first collection for French fashion house Chloe, and her own eponymous brand has secured investment from none other than LVMH themselves. Her Uruguayan background and family farm, still in the country, has given her brand a more sustainable and transparent feeling to it as well. So let's get into this collection. A large white cape opens the show. It's clean and simple, yet also has a dramatic tone. When I think of Hearst, I don't think of clothing that necessarily revolutionizes, but is rather high-end and luxurious. And while I don't think the cape will go down in history, it certainly caught my attention. A white knit gown is nice, and as it gets closer to the hem, the links begin to loosen. It allows a sort of luxurious grit, and yet seems like a smart garment to push as it's comfortable, yet fashionable, and easily worn at home or out and about. A muted 70s sensibility comes in a knit pants set and even further emphasized with a black leather trench coat. I hate to bring up Phoebe Philo and her Celine, but it does seem that quite a few American luxury labels, Peter Doe, The Row, and Gabriella Hurst, have been trying to court that customer since she left the brand. And while Hurst's work isn't exactly as radical as Philo's, the quality and vibe definitely seem to be here. Black leather is accentuated with white and brown strips that create a 60s or 70s feeling graphic that runs up dresses and coats. The strips create shape in a smart way or line the jacket, which adds to the luxury depending on the piece. A heavy wool utilitarian shirt was paired with a matching shin length skirt, which brings in the idea of workwear mixed with old world ideals of femininity. Hearst grew up in a traditional family, even noting that when she went to Australia at 17, it was new to see women having their own jobs. To then look at these pieces that are ever evidently inspired by workwear, but still holding on to this notion of womanhood might speak to Hearst's own notions of the world she lives in now, versus the one she grew up in. A silk trench coat has a bold sleeve with a slit right down the middle, which exposes the skin underneath. How utilitarian that really is, I don't know, but who said anything about a female designer always having to make utilitarian clothing? I think that's a dumb notion. It's also nice to see the bows on the shoulders. They're not exactly cutesy, but they're not exactly serious either. Again this dichotomy in Hearst's work emerges. Silky workwear styles with pants rather than skirts arrive, and while not revolutionary, they're surely an option for those wanting the workwear styles without having to don a skirt. The gigantic leather tote bags do add to the utilitarian notions of the collection and Hearst's work overall. A plunging v-neck black silky dress is paired over pants, which does have a sort of 60s and 70s styling notion. Again, seeing that influence come again and again makes me wonder why Hearst seems Seems to be drawn to those decades. And do we think she could help make dresses over pants en vogue? 
I hope so. A navy blue trench coat in the exact same cut is even better than the last one. Something about this dark blue feels so strong. And while certain design aspects do try to feminize the piece, I think the blue refuses to allow that to take place. Another dark blue set arrives, this time a knit sweater and skirt that is thick and lovely, and a pair of oversized pants makes itself known underneath. I have come to notice that for certain designers, the idea of a three-piece set that does not have to be a suit seems to be something explored a lot. Here it's done in comfortable and slouchy pieces that can be all separated and used independently of each other, but also encapsulates comfort as well. I think Hearst treats her clothing more like a display of product and less of display of marketing and advertising. And well, the product in my opinion is desirable as the newest Apple product, so I think it's working. Now, Hildegard von Binnen, who was a famed abbess and early adopter of holistic healing, was an inspiration for Hearst this season, which explains the floral motifs, and while I'm sure florals sell, it's nowhere near groundbreaking. A black floral set has a skirt with 3D flower appliques, while a different motif on a sweater and cardigan is much more 2D. I would prefer to see the sweater and the cardigan with the 3D flowers as we do see a white look that goes full out in this regard. The white version just feels more committed and the more you look at these 3D appliques the more you realize how pretty they are. It's a very interesting way of bringing about embellishments, especially in knitwear, but could also quote, spice up your wardrobe if that's what you consider spicy. I mean, people make spices out of flowers, I'm sure. Black and white versions of high-low capes came in a patchwork style. It's evident that influences from Hearst's native Uruguay creep into collections, and her ethical ideas do too. These capes were made by women artisans throughout Uruguay with the help of the Manos del Uruguay, a nonprofit which Hearst has championed before. Many designers bullshit about sustainability and ethics, but Hearst doesn't seem to be one of them. Having worked with Manos del Uruguay starting during her fall 2016 collection, this partnership and effort to uplift women from her homeland seems consistent and constant, and a true understanding of what luxury really is. Paying artisans the amount of money they're supposed to be paid. That's it. That's luxurious. A white dress is cut right at the middle with a zigzag stripe of black lace. Speaking so much of Phoebe Philo and Celine, I can't help but remember the spring 2016 collection that incorporated black lace on white slip dresses. Here, the dress starts as a knit, hits the black lace panel, and falls into a silky skirt. Personally, I don't understand the need to suture the skirt and top together, but if it sells, who am I to judge? A black version of the aforementioned dress works a bit better, as in the black, the differentiation of the fabric isn't so blatant, and the black lace strips does create more shape and is less of a stark detail. Another white dress, this time in a more stylized cut, is sweet yet strong. The lace strip here definitely emphasizes the waist, and while the top and skirt are different textiles, it isn't as obvious as the last white dress, which allows this dress to flow as a more coherent piece. A black version of the dress comes in a black knit style top cut with the black lace and a leather pleated skirt, and again, feels like a stronger notion than the first white look we saw. Sorry, I just keep shitting on that first white look, but you know, you see all these other versions and you're like, oof, you need help. A black lattice dress is sheer and has elements of lace dispersed throughout, and while I find it semi-revolting, I do think there is a customer for it. If Maria Grazia's Dior has taught me anything, garments like these can sell, and can sell very well. So while I can't stand it, especially with that hideous belt and gaudy flower buckle, this could be a commercial hit. I hope it's not, but it could be. The finale dress gives us one of the first, if not the first, curve model on a Gabriella Hurst runway, but the dress feels like an inelegant mishmash of previous styles. A full black lace bra is nowhere near as appetizing as when it was in a waist detail, and the 3D flowers don't look appealing either. A leather belt does help to accentuate the waist, but feels like an uneasy configuration as a knit skirt falls clumsily from beneath it, and the cable knit design on the skirt wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't accentuated with those horrible 3D flowers. It feels it feels like Hearst team threw everything except the kitchen sink on this dress, expecting it to work. But I find it strange that the brand wouldn't have adapted the rest of the easy and simpler styles for curvier customers. A beautiful leather trench coat, a knit dress, and a wool workwear set wouldn't have worked better than this finale look? I find that hard to believe. Overall, Gabriella Hearst this season was no doubt New York Fashion Week's anchor. And to be honest, it wasn't a lesson in over-the-top dramatics fashion. It was a lesson in subtlety, sustainability, and just nice clothing. New York, as a fashion capital, has had a very hard time finding its footing recently. But having a brand like Gabriella Hearst around could help pivot the week into something less about trying to compete with Paris or Milan or London. It could make it about just making nice 
clothing. New York Fashion Week as a whole wasn't much this season. To all the designers we reviewed, of course we cherish you, but with a loss of heavy hitters, New York felt kind of dry and forgettable. I hope that when September rolls around, the brands that fell off this season will get back into the game. Without them, it's hard to get eyes on the rest of the talent that doesn't have major funding or big bank accounts. So please let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. I'd love to hear all of your thoughts on these New York Fashion Week shows, collections, and my reviews. I will see you guys in the next one, and TTYL.